So um, before we get started, I guess across Essex, we really, really value bringing together people with an interest in data and analytics. And today we're opening up the doors for one of our communities to practice to everyone. Um, so typically we'll have sessions like this, these kind of formal sessions every few months or so. They're about sharing work, sharing practice, um, ways of working or methods and so on. Um, we tend to get a mix of local speakers, the people from our respective organisations uh, that will share their expertise, or we might get national experts that will share kind of best practice in the field, or simply just organisations sharing their work that they're, they're proud of and want to share with others. Um, for anyone really that uh, works with data uh, or with an interest in data uh, and primarily for the people in the kind of Essex public sector environment. So at the very end I'll return and give you a bit more information about how to stay involved with our communities. Uh, plus if you're joining us from outside the boundaries of Wonderful Essex uh, we can signpost you towards some resources and communities that you can connect with too. Um, in a moment, I'm going to pass to Mia Hatton, who is a data science community program manager at ONS. But then the bulk of the session itself will be led by senior analytics designer Rachel Newby, who is going to help us ensure all our good analytical work is hitting the right notes with our audiences. Um, lastly, though, before I pass over, as I mentioned, one of the highest volumes of people for a data talk session. So whilst you must all pay very, very close attention to the wisdom of Mia and Rachel, um, let's also get chatty. So let's use the chat function for our comments, our compliments, our questions, anything you wish to do. So um, I know you can all multitask because this is a practitioner session So you're all the kind of doers. Um, plus, you're also all data people. Uh, and I know you're therefore set in front of kind of two or three screens. Uh, so you can use the chat function in one and listen attentively to our speakers on the other. Um, it's really great hearing from everyone about the content we're going to cover. But also while uh, listening, do you think about what you might want to see in future communities as we seek to review and refine and refresh and ensure there is fit for purpose as the community as possible? Um, so that's it for me. And without further ado, I'm going to pass over to Mia, who's going to kick off the session. So over to you, Mia. Thanks so much, Stephen. And I really like that sentiment around multitasking and getting chatty. So I'm really excited to see things happening in the chat. Thanks everyone for having me here today briefly just to talk about uh, communities because as Stephen said this is a community of practice session that has been very kindly opened up beyond the boundaries of Essex County Council and I'm really excited to see that happening because uh, I manage the cross-government and public sector data science community which is another network that is open to anyone in the public sector with an interest in data science that being my role I'm really really passionate about seeing people working together collaborating and sharing their knowledge with each other. So managing this community has taught me so much about the value of building relationships through networks like this and of bringing people together for knowledge sharing events just like this one. Because by building up our networks, we learn about the different ways people are solving similar problems and we gain awareness of all the different kind of tools and projects that are, that are being developed all across the public sector that could be solving the problems that we have right now. So my focus with, with the, the public sector data science community is collaboration over duplication. What I want to see is people coming together and saying, what problem are you stuck on? Because I might be stuck on the same thing rather than trying to solve them in silos. And I actually try to follow that mantra in my own work. I'm not a data scientist myself. I'm a, I'm a program manager. But I try to follow the mantra by, by collaborating with people like Stephen and Claire who run this community of practice. I signpost events, I try to expand our reach and I try to make sure that we're rather than overlapping with other networks, we're supporting each other and making sure that all this incredible knowledge is available to as many people as possible. Because this is the thing, communities of practice are vital to ensuring that the information and tools we build don't go to waste. So by sharing your knowledge and your projects, you're maximising the impact of the work you do and supporting your, be your peers to build upon that work that you do. And I've just had a look now and there are 204 people in this meeting at the moment. So just think how much knowledge that represents, how many problems people, those 204 people between them have solved and how much you might learn by, by making just one new contact from those 204 people today. 
So our community does lots of things to support those kinds of collaboration. We have um, a regular newsletter. We run meetups often in a collaborative way. We kind of team up with other organizations and networks to run our meetings. And we do we have a number of sub communities as well that are that are managed by other people that I just support them on. So that includes linguistics data and also we have a sub community for for people that work in local government. Um, and our last conference which uh, took place in November it brought together people from 280 different public sector organizations and again you can just imagine how much knowledge was brought together in, in those three days where we had 30 odd sessions um, about public sector data science. So I'd recommend that you build your own community, whether that be internal in your own organization, whether it be across organizational boundaries, whether you attend some um, network meetings from various other communities or whether you just start building your own network yourself because you never know how much time you're going to save and how much support you're going to get on your next project by building that community around you. If you're interested in engaging with our community, we do have an event coming up next week and that is for our local government sub community um, and I'll post some information about that in the chat. I think Stephen's going to say a few words as well. Uh, but with that having been said, I'm not going to get in the way of this community's practice meeting. I'm going to uh, thank you very much for having me and hand over to Rachel Newby who's going to lead this session. Thank you very much. Thanks Mia. Um, hi everyone. So uh, thank you for that introduction. Um, I'm oh, I'm ahead of myself already. I'm Rachel Newby, a senior analytics designer at Essex Council, and I've been working on various different performance analytics teams for about 10 years now. Um, and actually one of the areas of work that I've found the most interesting is how we translate our data findings for different audiences and how we talk about data with people who aren't data people. And maybe they're not as excited about data as we are. Um, and it's really been interesting to see changes over the last decade and some really exciting growth in our capabilities in terms of what we can do as a team with data, but also in changes in how we communicate that data to various audiences, how we tailor and adapt our work um, and the new appetite for data that now exists. I think that's definitely an increased level of data literacy, uh, data kind of appetite from compared to about 10 years ago. So what we're going to talk about today is our data outputs, what makes them effective, what might they, why might they not be being used to their full impact, and a little bit about telling data stories and good visualizations. So hopefully everyone, what makes a good data output? Firstly, I think it's quite a difficult question. Um, so it's a little bit of a tough ask when I first started thinking about this section because a data output is a deliberately very broad term. It can mean a whole bunch of different things to different people. We might be talking about a Power BI dashboard. We might be talking about a summary report, an insight slide pack, a single chart. It could be a, a model, a forecast, a whole bunch of different things could come under that umbrella of a data output. Um, and any of these different products that we create might have completely different purposes, different aims, different audiences. So how do we then say what is good across all of these different things? Is there anything that they can have in common that we can say this is what a good data output looks like? Um, for me, the answer to that is impact. I think um, if we're searching for a common thread between all of our data in fact, um, data outputs, what we want is for our work to get used, for it to have impact. Um, we've all kind of probably had an experience where we've worked on uh, something really hard. We've come out with a, a data product we're, or project that we're really pleased with. We've shown it to the customer and they've done a little bit of a shrug and they're not very engaged. And that's the worst feeling because what we want most of the time is change, we want impact, we want action. And it doesn't always have to mean a drastic change. It could mean that they continue what they're doing because your work has reassured them that they're on the right track. So it doesn't mean they've got to do a U-turn, but we do want action when we show our customers our work. We do want them to do something. So on that, why might my insight not be being used. Um, no one wants to spend their time making something and get that kind of shrug reaction. They don't want to kind of invest a lot of time, resource and effort into making something that nobody uses. It's really crushing to our motivation. It's really frustrating, especially if you think this is something really good. It's got a real potential to be useful for them. But for some reason, 
they can't see it. No one else can see this. And the work is kind of sitting in a drawer, or hiding in a folder somewhere. And it's just not having that impact that you imagined. So why might that be? Uh, there are many possible answers to this, why your particular piece of work isn't getting used. You might recognise some of these um, and actually taking a kind of long, hard look at your work, listening to what your customer's saying and diagnosing that is the first stage in working out how we can solve that issue of how my insight is not getting used. Um, you might have heard something similar to like one of some of these before. Um, I mean, you can put bingo in the chat if you've heard all of them before. Hopefully not all of them. I've definitely had a few of these. Um, we've had lack of trust and questioning the figures, maybe a little bit of confusion, how to interpret results. Um, things about, oh, I didn't know we had this or maybe you can, can you send me this again? I can't remember where that lives. A few of these I've definitely had and I'm sure you have had a couple of those too. Um, and all of these kind of responses give us a clue as to the way that work might not be working for the customer. And actually, a lot of these have absolutely nothing to do with the quality of your analysis. You might have done a really brilliant piece of groundbreaking analytical work, but they can't see it because they don't know how to use it or they can't find it or, oh, it didn't quite land at the right time. So all of these kind of hurdles we might just not be making it just past those. And actually, all of those reasons, all those potential responses essentially boil down into three main things, which all uh, comes back to your customer. Your customer needs to be able to find your work. They need to be able to use your work. And when they find it, when they use it, it needs to show them something important. So thinking about our customer perspective across all of these, all three of these are essential because any data output is going to fall down if one of these three legs is missing. So it's no good really making something brilliant, exciting, really important. It's really easy to use, but you never actually show it to anyone. So nobody sees it. Nobody knows it exists. Nobody knows it's there. And similarly, it's no good doing all the promotion really brilliantly. Everyone knows about this piece of work. It's the number one thing they always hear about. You've made the design really slick. It looks lovely. It's got a great user interface. But actually, when the customer comes to use it, there's no substance there and they, they don't really know what to do with it. You're still going to get that kind of shrug response that you don't want. So starting off with the kind of find it part of the challenge, I think this is probably one of the easiest pitfalls to fall into, um, or I don't know if that's a personal reflection, but it's possibly because as analysts, we can it can be really tempted to get absorbed into the kind of the detail of the work, the problem solving aspect, um, and kind of forget about the bit where we've got to get it out there in front of the right people. Um, and if you came along to Stephen's session earlier in the week, you might have heard him talk about something similar. So once we have our data, once we've done something with it, we need to ensure that the right people actually see the important information. Um, and e even though it's really crucial, it can be easy to forget. And um, this sort of find it element of the equation is a mix of different things. So part of that is making sure people um, kind of hear about your work through the sort of comms channels that you might have, promoting our work. You might have newsletters, blogs. You might think about doing a stakeholder mapping exercise of all of these kind of traditional routes about promoting our work to the right audience. But another part of that is also helping people to find our, our work for themselves um, and thinking about how we share that work and this kind of infrastructure, the platforms, the systems that we use in order to share that work. So the very first stage that we don't always think about about in terms of how our work literally goes, gets to in front of people's eyes are the stages between their thinking, oh, well, maybe I'll have a look at that dashboard. And then what point do they then see that information on the screen? So this is the very first part of the customer's user experience. And we can sometimes, <clears throat> excuse me, forget about this. So for example, if we think about how Amazon or ASOS, one of these big companies, they streamline our user experience to make sure that we buy. How many clicks does it take between thinking, oh, I probably were gonna buy a new pair of socks, and then it's on its way to you immediately. You can buy that with one click, one purchase, it's there. Um, and they've intentionally done that. They've minimised every single possible point of resistance because every step that's not strictly necessary in that process is a chance that they're going to lose the sale. 
So maybe I'll get distracted. I'll add it to my basket and I didn't get to the checkout because I wandered off, decided to make dinner. Or maybe I gave up because I found I, I got to the point of paying and I needed to find my debit card, type the number in manually and I kind of got distracted again. And if I do get distracted, these companies, they double down. They say, we saw you were interested in this. I've emailed you. Do you want to buy it now? And they come back to you. And we can pick up some of that as well. So we can make our work easier to find. We can make it so that we're reminding people of its existence. We're signposting people, um, checking back. So even things like, are those slides easy to find again? Can Do they remember who they need to speak to if they had a question? Is it easy to share this on with their team? Um, who do they ask if they've got a problem? All these little things really make a difference. And we don't necessarily have to streamline down it, everything to the level of one click Amazon purchase, but we can borrow a lot of these principles to make sure that the experience is easier for our customer. Um, and if the current process is you've sent it to them and now they need to search their inbox for that email that you sent three weeks ago, and then they need to find the link, and then they need to click the link, remember what it's called, go down three subtitles, then choose their team name, then they've got to try filters, then that's a lot of points of friction for that customer. So that is going to get in the way of them finding your work. So even something like hosting all your dashboards that are relevant to your customer in one place, really consistently signposting them there, that can make a really big difference in the impact of your work through this stage and helping them find it. And I'm going to put a cheeky plug in for the next session by my colleague Adam, who's talking much more about the, the benefits of cloud reporting platform. So 215, another good session to tune into. Um, so next, we're hoping your, your customers found your work, they've made their way there, whether you've sent it to them directly or they've stumbled across it somewhere, they've got there. And now you really want them to use it. So again, you want to make this as really as easy as possible for them to do that. Um, and again, one of the ways of doing that is removing some of the barriers and removing some of those resistance points. If you imagine yourself as the customer, you've just got that email, you've clicked the link, you've opened the dashboard, the report, whatever piece of work that is, and you see loads of information. It's confusing, it looks messy, the colours are giving you a bit of a migraine, you're not really sure what that title means or what it's trying to show you. And if you're already busy, you've already got loads of other things to do, is it inviting for you to spend your time trying to work out what this means, what it's for, what it's trying to tell you? Or is it more tempting to think, oh, well, maybe I'll crack on with something else and I might come back to that later? So some people are of the kind of old school school of thought that it doesn't really matter what it looks like as long as it gets the job done. Why am I wasting time making it look nice? Um, and I would say there is a middle ground here. You probably don't want to spend hours and hours deciding between Arial font or Calibri font, but how you your work looks does make a uh, does really matter because it makes it's a really quick way to put people off and to make them less likely to want to look at it, less likely to want to use it. And our customers don't have the same expectations that they had even 10 years ago. They're used to seeing data. They're used to seeing really nice, clean, simple interfaces. They've got a Fitbit. They've got a banking app. They see their Spotify wraps. So they know that data can be accessible. They can look nice. It can be easy. So they're much less tolerant now of wading through something difficult because they think that's the only way that you can do it. The other thing that's going to really help you uh, to enable your customer to use your work is building those relationships with the data team, building that trust, building that data literacy. Um, and I'm not going to talk too much about data literacy today, but I'll give another plug. There was a really great session earlier in the week. Um, so if you missed that, go back, do watch the recording because uh, data literacy is really, really key in getting people, enabling them to look at and use our work and coming at it from both angles. We're making it easier for them and we're also building up their confidence, confidence in using our work, making them more able to use it whilst it's more user friendly. So the last one of these three, um, you, don't, you don't want to do all of that work at the beginning if you haven't actually got anything important or useful to say. Um, you need to have a message, you need something to explain or something you're going to highlight, something that's relevant and important to your customer. And actually that's really, really difficult to do if you don't know your customer and you don't know what's important to them. 
So to find out kind of what's important, you need to know not just your data, but a bit about what your audience, what they know already, what they're interested in, what problems they're trying to solve, what sort of thing would be helpful in their day to day. And once you've found that thing to tell them, you still need to make sure that the message doesn't get lost. So you don't want to bury it in terms of loads of other information. You don't want to cryptically hint at what you're trying to tell them. You don't want to make it so dull that they've actually switched off and they're not engaged at all anymore. By the time you get to your point, you want to make it as easy and as quick as possible for your audience to see and hear your message. And ideally, you want to capture their imagination by telling the data story. Um, and we're going to talk about this a bit more later, but it's no good if there's a message in there somewhere, but no one knows what that message is. So we talked about those three things. We've got to find it, we've got to use it, we've got to tell them something important, but as I touched on, to do these things really well, it actually needs a whole range of different skills. It's not just kind of three things. And all of those things come together to make a really good data output. And I think this really plays well into the kind of idea around a, a community of practice, lots of different skills, lots of different people who have different fortes. So it's actually about, um, it might be your colleague is really good at this, Staff, um, an area that you're not so good at. It might be that you want to draw in your, your comms and engagement people, um, all different skills, different subject matter experts, training, data literacy, all of these different kind of skills are going to come together that to mean that we hit those three points and we make sure that people can do all of these things. And it doesn't mean you have to nail all of these things personally. But if you have a piece of work and it's not landing, it's worth considering that overall picture and kind of evaluating why it's not landing and, and which of these areas is kind of letting you down and holding you back. Um, so all of these skill sets are going to have an impact and each piece of work um, will be successful in different ways. So we might do some things well, some things less well, and actually you can have two brilliant pieces of work that have kind of a different profile across this range of skills. I've got a really quick quiz for you now, um, so hopefully you can get involved. I think um, Claire or Stephen's going to put the, the, the link in the chat, but you can also use the QR code. Um, we've already mentioned that our customers are under time pressure, they're bombarded with information. And a couple of years ago, we asked one of our senior leaders, or actually the PA, I think, um, what their week looked like. So see if you can guess some of these figures um, and kind of see what we think about um, these uh, statistics about an, an average week. Hopefully that quiz is working, I'm not sure. So Rachel, uh, I have been able to complete and submit my quiz answers, so it should, if, if possible, to do it, if whether or not you're seeing the other things the other oh, side. Oh, OK, possibly I'm not seeing it, but well, hopefully you've had a chance and I'll whiz through. So uh, how many emails in an average working week? Uh, don't know what we've picked here, but let me, so 545 in just one average working week. It's quite a lot of emails to deal with. We've got, I think these should have updated, but I'm not sure how, that they have. So we've got how many email attachments? 212, 212 documents, email attachments to work through, to kind of read in advance um, of different meetings, that sort of thing, uh, to kind of give context. 33 meetings across that week um, in terms of 
face to face time. So not much time left for kind of reading those attachments, reading those emails. And finally, 497 pages of supporting documents for all of those meetings that different people are expecting um, you to read in advance to kind of know uh, what is um, what the meeting is about. So I don't I hopefully that quiz did work if it didn't, I'm sorry, but gives you a bit of a demonstration in terms of how much volume of stuff we're asking people to see and how bombarded they are with information so that under all this, this time pressure and our work really needs to kind of stand out it needs to be really clear if we're going to break through some of that noise and try to generate some action so enough we're going to do that if we're going to break through that noise we need to be really clear with our message um, and going back to that point earlier if we don't know what our customer is looking for um, it's really difficult for us to give them something that they will find useful. Um, and given that they see so much information, it can feel a little bit like showing them this as one of the many, many slides and many, many pages of documents they've got to read before a meeting. So there's loads of detail there. There's probably something really interesting, but it's hard to tell. It's very overwhelming. And if I don't know what they're looking for, I've got absolutely no idea where to point them. So if you receive this, you probably don't know what to do with it. If I tell you that the customer in this example, it, their main goal is to find where's Wally, they probably can find him eventually, but given that all the information is there as it is, it might take them a really long while. And actually they might probably give up uh, before they find him. Maybe uh, I know that they're looking for Wally and actually maybe I have found him. So if I zoom in, I'll show you a little bit less of that information you don't need. It gets slightly easier to, for you to find him. I don't know if anyone's found him already, but it's still quite complicated. Um, and if you don't have that level of trust in kind of my analysis and, and, and kind of my expertise, you might not even trust that I have actually found him. Um, and it could be that I, I did find him, but it took me a long time. So I want to make it still look quite complicated to show off to you that I've done lots of work. So I leave a lot of detail there um, just so that you know this was quite hard. I want to kind of demonstrate that. But actually, what's much easier for them to see if I show you where he is, you don't need to do the finding part because I've showed you. Um, and this is what we want to do for our customers. We don't want to fall into the trap of giving them all of the information and hoping that they come up with the kind of uh, the same conclusion that we did uh, by themselves. And as much as possible, we want to tell them, we want to show them, uh, we kind of want to demonstrate with our visuals what they need to know um, and make it really easy and quick, as easy and quick as we can. Um, and there's that great Steve Jobs quote that says it takes a lot of hard work to make something simple. But essentially, this is what we're aiming for with our work. We're aiming to shortcut all of the work that we've done and give our customers that knowledge, that insight, that just small nugget of what they need to know. So um, I'm going to uh, show a very short clip. Uh, this is Cole. Nuss Barmer, I've probably uh, pronounced that name wrong, but she has a really great book around storytelling with data. And this uh, clip just highlights um, a couple of tips of things that you can do to improve your storytelling and kind of your clarity of message. Please shout if you can't hear. So, Cole, if you had to just give three tips to listeners uh, on how to improve their storytelling with data skills, what would they be? So my first would be to be really specific about who your audience is and design everything you're doing with that audience in mind. So I think too often we design a you know, communication, write a PowerPoint deck, say, for ourselves, for our data, for our project. It's really easy to do. It's actually a much harder but more effective thing to step out of ourselves and think about how do we design this first and foremost for our audience? which means thinking about things like, who are they? What do they care about? What keeps them up at night? Yeah. Uh, because if we can frame what we need our audience to know or to do in terms of those motivating factors, 
then we get their attention and can get our message across. So I think first would be audience. Second, and I mentioned this earlier, but would be think about where you want your audience to look and create sparing contrast to achieve that. And the easiest way to do that is sparing use of color. Yeah. And right? if we think about not designing anything to be colorful, but rather working in grayscale and then using color really intentionally as a cue to our audience that tells them where they're meant to look, that can be really effective for more quickly getting our audience to the point that we're trying to make. Yeah. And then thirdly would be words use words. I think sometimes when people think of data visualization, they think it should all be numbers and pictures and that words have no place. But words play a very important role in making those numbers and pictures understandable for yeah. our audience. So that means we need to title, right? Every axis should have a title. If there is a key takeaway, which if you're at the point of explaining something, there should be, put that down in words, right? Yeah. If we do those three things, we think about our audience, we design with them in mind, we use color sparingly to focus attention and words that tell our audience why we want them to look there and what the takeaway is, that's a successful scenario for communicating effectively with data. Perfect. Well, I was fortunate to attend one of your workshops a couple of years yeah. ago, and I do remember the tips around colour, and I have actually taken that forward since. Awesome. And I do seem to get more speaking gigs, so maybe maybe, it's, <laughs> it works. You know, maybe I owe you, <laughs> owe you some commission or something. But so, as I said, fortunate to attend a couple of years ago. And, what, and one of the other things that really struck me during the the, the masterclass that, that you ran was around the narrative art yeah. that you took from classic storytelling. Uh, and how you applied it to presenting data. Yep. Um, I think that'd be something our listeners would really enjoy hearing about. Sure thing. So if we think of a story, stories typically follow this narrative arc where you start out, there's a plot. Tension is introduced. That tension builds in the form of a rising action. It reaches a point of climax. There's a falling action, a resolution. Turns out we are hardwired to remember stories that come at us in that form. Challenges, the typical business presentation doesn't look anything like that, right? Mm -hmm. Typical business presentation follows a linear path where maybe we start off with the question, right? What did we set out to solve for in the first place? Then the data, where did we get it? What did we do to it? What assumptions did we make? Then the analysis, what were the actual statistical methodologies we employed? And then finally, our findings or a recommendation. This is the typical path of a business presentation. And that's because this is the path that comes most naturally because it's the path we typically go through when we are analyzing data. But it is a very selfish path because at no point along that typical linear path do I have to give any thought to my audience. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's the biggest shift that happens when we think about our business communications, not along a linear path, but reframing them, making use of this narrative arc. Because to have an arc, you have to have tension. And it's not about making up tension, right? If you, there's no tension, you'd have nothing to communicate about in the first place. And also it's not the tension that matters to you, right? It's coming back to audience. It's the yeah. tension that matters to them. If you can identify that, you can get their attention, build credibility and drive them to the action you need. Uh, so we teach the narrative arc, we teach it in our workshops, both books go into this as a framework to be able to use as another way to think about how you might communicate data-driven findings. In this series, we will be speaking to a... All right, so Carl mentioned there the importance of a good narrative, a good story, and I think that's really, really crucial. Um, and kind of constructing that story out to take people with you, to remember your data, to engage with what you're showing them, to make them feel inspired to act is really, really vital. And I think one recent example that I've seen, um, kind of a data example uh, of this, is the kind of recent news uh, issue around the post office scandal. You might have seen the drama. Um, you probably have heard about it, even if you haven't seen the ITV, uh, the, the series, but hundreds of postmasters had their lives ruined by an issue with the Horizon computer system. And Computer Weekly had been writing articles about this scandal for 20 years with in-depth analysis, loads of information, really important story, something really important that people need to know about. But for 20 years of reporting, somehow it didn't quite cut through to public consciousness. And actually, it was only when the ITV drama captured 
the kind of individual stories, some of the emotion behind it, some of that kind of journey. And suddenly there was a lot more public interest, a lot more political action. All of a sudden things start to change. You hear things in the news, you get action. And I think it just kind of really demonstrates um, what she was just mentioning there, that actually we need to kind of think about how we tell things in a kind of story way so that we're capturing what people find important. In the video, Cole also mentions about getting that kind of design right, using colour really well, using visual tools to kind of support you to tell your story and reinforce what you're saying, make it memorable rather than kind of distract from your, your story. And kind of even the prettiest design isn't going to fix your bad content, but if you can ruin good content with poor design with ugly dashboards. Um, we've probably all seen something, probably hopefully not quite as bad as this, but something similar. Um, and actually, I kind of love finding them in the wild. So if you see something hideous, um, please share, put it in the chat. I'd like to see. Uh, but ugly uh, dashboards, ill thought out charts, things that just have not a lot of thought going into them. These are really off-putting. And as we went back to what we were saying earlier, we want to make sure that we're not putting off our customers, we're not putting barriers in the way. We want to be enabling them to get to your message and illustrating what you're trying to say, not being kind of stumbling block that puts them off and turns them away from your work. Um, I've got another little poll, which I don't know, we had a slight uh, technical issue last time, so I don't know, hopefully you'll be able to see this one update, but if not, perhaps, um, Someone can let me know what the winner is. Um, before we talk a little bit more about how to kind of do that with your visuals, a really quick poll for you now to see uh, if we can elect a favourite chart. I think you can also add a uh, an extra one if, you, if I haven't captured your favourite in there. But um, hopefully you can use the poll. Um, maybe doesn't look like responses are coming up. So maybe uh, just in one minute, Stephen, can you just let me know? what the winner is. Um, apologies for the, the technical hitch there. But yeah, uh, yes, I will do if I can do. I'll give people a few minutes to respond. Thank you. But I appear to be struggling myself. Oh, here we go. I'm coming up with something. No, I'm not. <laughs> yes, this might be one of those where we just all agree it was 3D pie chart and move on. OK, well, sorry about that. We've had a, a technical pitch, but we will agree to 3D pie chart, best chart ever. Um, don't write in or maybe do write in. But actually, now that we've agreed that the 3D pie chart is the best, we can use that for everything. Um, but really, the answer is kind of it's horses for courses. So any test of any good visualisation really is, uh, does it tell the user what they need to know? Is it quick and easy to understand? And does it enable the user to act? So it really depends whether a good uh, visualisation really depends on its purpose. Pie charts get a lot of hate, um, although it might be the favourite. Uh, but in the right context, they can actually be really impactful. So this Apple Watch example, it tells you what you need to know. It tells you that quickly. It doesn't take up much space and you know what action you need to take based on one glance at that picture. And in my book, that's a successful visualisation, even if really it's a glorified pie chart. Um, and as we just talked about, you don't want your visuals to put people off, but you also don't want to fall into the trap of style over substance. You don't want to make a really beautiful, never before seen looking lovely visual if no one knows what to do with it. Um, and the classics are classics for a reason. Simple but effective is better than complex and confusing. So uh, the database catalog that I've kind of uh, linked to there is a really good tool. I like it for suggesting charts that fit to the purpose of what you're trying to do. So you can search by by function. So if you're comparing two variables, if you want to show a trend, you can search for different options based on what you're trying to do. And fitting the chart to the purpose is ultimately the best way to have a good visualization. 
Um, I also wanted to mention here, there's a really great course by the University of Essex as part of their summer school. If you want to go into more detail around the kind of the practicalities of actually creating visualizations, how to do that, um, just a little plug for that. That's a really great course. Um, there are, I'm sure, lots of other visualization courses which are great, but we won't have time to touch into that too much today. But what we can have as an example of a lot of the time, quite small, really easy changes can make a really big difference in terms of how usable a visual is. So we've got this example here. Uh, this is a chart showing some survey results from uh, adult social care. Um, and if you look at that screen, do any key messages immediately jump out of you from that chart? I'm going to hazard a guess and say probably not. Um, if they do, well done to you. But even if you're quite familiar with this data, it's very easy for this chart to kind of wash past you without taking anything in, without kind of knowing what's important from that chart. Um, and it's not wrong. The information is all there. But it's just not that helpful. Um, there's lots of barriers for the reader to actually see anything interesting going on. There's kind of you've got two different keys. You've got unclear colours. It's, it's not in any sort of or immediately obvious order, the text is diagonal, there's a lot of visual things going on that aren't helping us. Um, and this isn't to say that it's a bad chart, this is from NHS Digital. So in this form, it's for a general audience. It, you can tell that it hasn't been tailored to tell a message, it's simply making the information available. And there's nothing wrong with that in its context. But if my customer comes to me and asks, how do we compare on our survey results? I could be really lazy. I can say, oh, I've got a chart on that and I can send them this. Um, just copy and paste it into a report just as it is and send them a bunch of charts similar to this for every question. Uh, but realistically, if I do that, how much of it are they going to take in? How much of the message are they going to see? Um, or how much time are they going to have to invest in order to kind of find that message? So I'm putting more work onto the reader to do that unpicking, to do uh, that kind of exploration, which they may or may not do. As we talked about earlier, they're very busy. They might just give up before they get to that stage. Um, so how does this compare? What, which uh, local authority is doing the best? You, it is there, but you probably can't see it. So making even just some quite basic changes uh, can make this much easier for the audience to process. So it's the exact same information here. It's just been slightly reformatted. So it's still a basic bar chart, really. Um, but I know that they're looking at Essex. So I've pulled out Essex with that colour, um, just as we mentioned in the video. I've used clear wording. I've put a heading in here. Lots of these tiny little things that are really easy, not technically difficult things to do, but actually the combination of these small things, changing the legend, changing the labels, doing these really small things can help you to answer that question. And now if I ask you, well, how does this compare? Which, which, which local authority is doing best? You can really quickly see that information, hopefully. You can kind of answer those questions and move on. And this kind of takes us back really to where we began around that sort of spectrum of skills and all of those kind of small wins, all of those little changes, they gradually add up, um, especially if we're looking at kind of areas that we have been slightly neglecting. So all of these different kind of areas of focus, all of the different types of skills, if we kind of diagnose where we're going wrong, we can, we can often have a really big impact from just a little bit of work. And the difference between an OK data output and a really great data output might be um, something quite small. There is a, a kind of element of the law of diminishing returns here. If you've already invested loads of time, loads of work on getting one area, uh, one part of your, your projects really spot on, then and you've neglected something else, then actually 10 minutes sharing your work at the right meeting and making sure so that the customer actually finds it might do more in terms of your impact than spending another 10 days tweaking your analysis slightly or, or tweaking that chart slightly to make it look nicer visually, changing the colours. So it's all about kind of balancing out and identifying where you need to add that work, where your kind of data output is falling down for the customer. And kind of on that note, uh, hopefully, go to the next one. 
just as we're finishing up, I wanted to include a few kind of practical ideas of really small things that you can do uh, in this space. So if you have a piece of work, it's not landing exactly how you wanted um, and you've identified, OK, maybe this problem seems to be but no one's actually finding it. There are things you can do uh, in 30 minutes or less um, that you might help to kind of build up the profile of your, your piece of work and make a difference. Uh, help it to have more impact. Um, and this isn't obviously an exhausted list. Love to see more tips. Um, I think one of the kind of real values of having a community of practice is sharing knowledge between us um, and kind of having that collaborative effort and all learning from each other because actually we all do different elements of this well, different elements less well. So there's, there's things that we, we're comfortable doing, that we love doing, that we want to spend time on. And everyone's got those areas where it's not their favourite and they probably don't want to spend loads of time on it. And actually, maybe that's where they can make some really quick wins. So really easy things that you can do uh, that will take 30 minutes that might help bring your kind of piece of work uh, slightly up into kind of a more usable piece of work. So finally, I think we're just coming to the end of the session now, but just to recap what we've uh, talked about today, um, our customers need to be able to find our work, they need to be able to use it, and it needs to tell them it's something important if they are going to take action based on what we've done and if our work is going to have impact. So we need to do all of those things well. Um, for the most impact, we want to draw across those skills that we just mentioned from all across the team. We want to bring people in, uh, work collaboratively. That's the best way that we're going to kind of meet all of those things. We need to know what our story is before we can start to tell it. Um, we need to kind of identify that story and spend time working on crafting a narrative. We need to make sure that we're not hiding our really good work, our really good content behind distracting design, poor design, layers of kind of things that we don't want to see. And we want to show people what we mean. So be really clear with our visuals, with anything that we're adding in, in terms of visualizations, making sure that that illustrates what we're saying and we've got a really clear, succinct point. And finally, those small tweaks really can make a huge difference. So it might not be that we need to kind of have a um, it might not be an issue with our analysis at all. Our work might be really, really strong in that area. And actually small, small things can give us kind of low hanging fruit that gives us those kind of easy wins to make the difference between something that is an OK data output to something that is really great. So um, that is me. I thank you, everyone, for your time today. I really hope you found it a useful session. And thanks for listening and um, participating in the chat. I'm going to hand over to Stephen now at the end to talk about the, our community of practice and how you can get involved and come stay in touch with us. Um, but thank you for your time. Thanks for listening. And thank you very much, Rachel. That's really, really um, awesome to see. And I think some real practical things there that uh, people can take away and instantly apply in their day-to-day -day role, because like you covered, it's incredibly important that the right people are able to find their information at the right time, understand it and so on. Because uh, if they don't, then <laughs> what's the point of all the stuff that came before it? So absolutely fantastic seeing all of that and lots of great uh, engagement in the chat. I'm, I'm, I'm sure people really, really appreciated that. Uh, so continue with your feedback in there. Um, I'm going to quickly close up now. Um, I know there's been some questions in the chat. We'll endeavour to try and respond to as many people as possible from there. Uh, but I'm going to sum up very quickly at the end um, and um, talk about the community of practice itself. Um, so we, we want our community to be uh, more than just these kind of periodic virtual gatherings. Uh, we want to create a much more of a kind of holistic community where people are connected and able to share and talk between themselves outside of their kind of scheduled calendar events. So over in the course of the next few months, we'll be looking to review, revise the kind of mechanisms for uh, how we deliver these communities. And if you want to stay in the loop or if you want to contribute to what that may look like, then please contact Hector at essex.gov.uk. Let me drop that in the chat right now while I have it to mind. Um, so there we go. Uh, and if you visited us today from outside of the kind of wonderful boundaries of Essex, we opened our doors to you today. I hope you found that useful as well. Uh, if you want to talk about kind of communities of practice, then please do get in touch still. Um, 
but yes, if you visited us from outside Essex and you're kind of all of a sudden thinking, what can you do to stay involved and you're even considering moving to Essex uh, to kind of trigger some kind of loophole, um, there are other communities for you as well. And I'd like to begin with uh, an event that Mia mentioned at the top um, that she's pulled together for the data science in local government community. Um, that is next week. It's featuring a hands on workshop with developers of policy priority inference at the Allen Turing Institute uh, and a panel discussion on establishing your data strategy. Uh, and these sessions that are both for practitioners like some of the people here today and for data leaders also like some of the people here today. And you can register for that event on Teams. Again, I'll drop it once more into the chat. Um, We'd always love to hear from any of you, regardless of where your desk is based in Essex or otherwise. So please, please do continue to stay in touch, reach out to any one of us, and we're always happy to help where we can. Um, I guess I would like to end now by once again thanking uh, Mia for her introduction uh, and her talk uh, on the value of communities of practice. And once again, thank you to Rachel for um, her expertise, really, in how to ensure that all of our good data work is landing and having the impact we want it to because at the end of the day that's why we're doing this that's why we are analysts we want people to hear our understanding hear our insights and take action from it to create a better kind of uh, world for, for the people in it so thanks again to rachel